The first status quo. Blind Eye. Tuesday, December 24, 2013. 1.30 p.m. I hurry along the Hay Street Mall in the baking Western Australian heat, bump into a street juggler and yell, Sorry! and walk backwards into a group of noisy girls wearing styrofoam antlers who look crossly as I stumble. I duck past the plaintive guitarist and the Salvation Army man with the portable stereo and into a lingerie store playing Michael Bublé's version of It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas, where the air conditioning gives me an icy blast. Almost simultaneously, a desiccated woman with collagen lips asks, May I help you? I need to buy something for, for my wife. What did you have in mind? I look furtively at the risque mannequins in the store, and then in a panic, down at my watch. Oh no! We do have some lovely... Uh, thanks, but my lunch break finished five minutes ago, I say, running out of the store. Sorry! I yell, crashing into the same reindeer girls who shout, Merry Christmas! angrily to my retreating back. A few minutes later, I'm in the elevator of my office building, still panting, wiping furiously with my shirt sleeve at the relentless sweat oozing unfairly from every pore in my scalp. Come on, come on, I whisper, counting the floors on the display, cursing quietly to myself as the lift stops at the second level, only to be filled with at least twelve fat people with smoker's breath, who turn the thermostat up by five degrees just by getting in, and who wrinkle their noses distastefully at me. When the elevator voice finally announces, Level 18, I squeeze between the moist human rolling pins, which reluctantly release me into the lobby of Dixon, Cox and Peters, barristers and solicitors. There I stand, shirt untucked and slightly translucent, tie uneven. Lucy, the receptionist, carefully painted with impressionist brush strokes, looks up only momentarily from her computer screen and then continues typing as she speaks in a nasal monotone. Mr. Blessab has been waiting for 15 minutes. Uh, oh, uh, your wife called. No, Mr. Dixon is looking for you. Oh, no, my voice wavers with my footsteps as I run towards the toilets. Lucy, could you uh, please tell Mr. Blesser I've been delayed by another five minutes. Gingerman, where in heaven's name have you been? I stop in my tracks. M Mr. Dixon. Well, it's uh, Christmas Eve. It's not this firm's practice to keep clients waiting. Lucy, arrange for Mr. Blessav to be escorted right up. Now, for heaven's sake, Georgievic, tuck in your shirt, try and make a good impression. Yes, sir. And another thing. Do something about your perspiration problem. I've told you before, they have doctors who can treat that sort of thing. You look like a wreck. <sighs> Yes, sir. He closes his eyes and shakes his head slowly. When he opens them again, he says, Now, on a different note, I told your charming wife that Agnes and I are happy to accept your invitation to lunch tomorrow. Uh, oh, uh, 3.30 p.m. Want to see my new office? Says a chubby face sticking over the top of my cubicle. I had heard his self-assured stomping from a mile off, but I was earnestly hoping he'd leave me alone. I'm flicking a pencil around my finger. My shirt is still untucked. My tie is even more uneven, and my hair has dried into Billy Idol tufts. Mate, you don't look so good. You ever ask a doctor about your sweating problem? Brad is wearing his perpetually wide-eyed, rue-in-the-headlights expression. Look, I'm I'm kind of busy right now. Yeah? Well, I'm off early. Old man Dixon might know. I've already built till 8.30 p.m. <laughs> You've got to check out my office, though. I mean, the river view is something else. Uh-huh. Uh Lucy's my secretary. Can't complain about that, eh? Of course, you're married, so you're not even allowed to look. <laughs> Do you like Christmas, Brad? I look up from the pencil. I mean... Do you get into the Christmas spirit, or is it just another public holiday to you? Brad looks at me blankly. What do you mean? Of course I like Christmas. 
Never used to, though. Right now, he says, slapping me on the back so hard that my pencil drops out of my hands and falls behind the back of my desk. Everything's looking pretty good. I mean, I have a great job with a new office. And hey, I've got you guys, the family I never had. Ha <laughs> ha! Why, don't you like Christmas, Dan? I think for a minute before answering. With me, it's the other way around. I, I used to like Christmas. Now, uh, cheer up, mate. You need some R&R. &R. Anyhow, he lowers his voice. Did you get me something to give to your missus? I open the top drawer of my desk and pull out a package. Uh, it's a watch. I even gift wrapped it. Cool. Thanks, mate. I'll have to pay you for it later. Say, have any luck yourself? No, I might go out and have another look after work. What a rotten shame. Anyhow, see you tomorrow at your place. What time is it again? Uh, 12.30. I'll be there and I won't be square. Ha <laughs> ha, says Brad, tucking the package into his jacket and galumping off in his heavy-footed way, whistling, I'll be home for Christmas. 8.22 p.m. Despite the failing light, the air is still as hot as a pizza oven as I pull my 1991 Corolla into my driveway, carefully averting my gaze from the towering weeds that are thriving in my garden and the cocos palms that are not. Kylie's BMW convertible is still parked in the garage, so I take a deep breath before heading towards the door. I'm home, I say hopefully. Kylie? About time, she appears on the landing. Why didn't you return my call? I was in a meeting, Pumpkin. I'm sorry. Never mind. Kylie's putting on her pearl earrings. The ones she exchanged for the earrings I bought her last Christmas. I was going to tell you to stop by the supermarket on the way home and pick up some things for tomorrow. I can still go. The shops are open till late. Don't bother. I've already done it. Somebody's got to do the planning in this house. Here, help me with this zip. The problem with you, Dan, is that you never think about anyone but yourself. I zip her dress. Thank you. You know how busy I've been preparing this place for your friends and relatives. I had to miss tennis. And you never do anything in the garden. God knows it's so embarrassing. I'm just going to have to grin and bear it. Next weekend, you're going to pull up your shirt sleeves and do some work out there. I mean it. Oh, and I invited Mr. and Mrs. Dixon to lunch tomorrow. Yes, Mr. Dixon told me. Honestly, Dan, by the look on your face, I'd swear you never want a raise. Well, if you won't do something about it, I will. Look at Brad. He knows how to get where he wants. You should be more like him. Um, Kylie, where are you going? Girls' night out, stupid. Don't you remember? With Yvonne and Leanne. But it's Christmas Eve. Don't start that again. I just thought... Look, I told you weeks ago. I don't see what your problem is, says Kylie, adjusting herself in the hallway mirror. No, it's just that I miss you, honey, I say, placing my arms around her Zumba slender waist, but she winces and pushes down on my forearms. Stop that. You know what that leads to. Anyway, must fly. She sticks out her cheek for me to peck. Mwah! You can play your guitar or something. Have last night's leftovers for dinner. They won't keep any longer anyway. I uh, got you a present. I pick up the package I'd placed near the coat rack and Kylie pauses. Oh, Dan, what is it? Clothes? It feels like clothes. But you know you have bad taste. I can't bear it. Can I open it now? If you like, I say as Kylie tears at the wrapping. Lingerie! <laughs> you, you got me lingerie for Christmas! Oh, Dan, you're priceless! That is the worst present! Hope you kept the docket! Yes, of course. Good. No harm done, then, <laughs> she says, handing me the open package. I'll be back late, so don't wait up. Bye-bye now! I'm still standing, holding the package, looking at the closed door long after she has left. Bugsy, our cat, is on the kitchen bench top next to an empty food bowl, meowing and swishing his tail uncertainly. So I toss the present under the dying tinsel-decked fir tree and walk towards the feline. Hold on, Bugsy, I say, searching through the cupboard for the fish-shaped biscuits, 
Finding none, I open a can of Kylie's premium tuna in spring water. Merry Christmas, I say, shaking the contents into the bowl. Bugsy sniffs delicately before burying his blunt face into the food. Kylie had found him a year before on our verge, bleeding profusely from a head wound. The vet said it would be better to put him down, but Kylie was adamant he should be saved. After some very expensive surgery and a lengthy convalescence, the cat recovered, albeit that he was left with a droopy left eyelid. Kylie had wanted to call him Lucky. I thought that since we were going to name him after a gangster, we should call him Bugsy. It's one of the few times I've had my way. I remove my tie, then I remove my ring, which I carefully place in my front trouser pocket. The latter is a ritual I perform only when I am alone, since Kylie thinks a wedding ring should never be removed. It's bad luck, she always says. Yet somehow I've never gotten used to wearing it, probably because it leaves a deep, itchy indentation on my finger. You've gained weight, says Kylie, but I know I haven't. We met while I was in my final year of law school, and Kylie was still working at the supermarket. Back in those days, my mother would insist on introducing me to the daughters of the women in her bridge club. You're not meeting the right ladies, Daniel, she would say. An eligible boy like you needs a quality girl. Kylie was such a girl. She was a pretty, brown-faced girl, short with a slim waist, the promise of stocky legs, dyed blonde hair. At first she seemed shy and quiet. Conversations between us were inevitably stilted and punctuated by crimson blushes, although she had no such difficulty speaking with Mum, to whom she would listen earnestly, adding, I know, I know, and can you imagine, at appropriate junctures. When I voiced my concerns to Mum, she replied, She's nervous, dear. That's to be expected when a girl likes you. Honestly, I've never met a more charming, intelligent girl. Kylie also had no difficulty speaking to Brad, who she already knew from the Orthodox Church youth group. We're like brother and sister, really, she says, and who still reduces her to fits of giggles. Although we started law school together, I barely knew Brad until our final year, when we were placed in the same tutorial. He was the kind of guy who knew everyone, but whom no one would admit to being friends with. One of those people with no sense of personal space, and a fashion sense one decade behind the rest of us. Lend us your notes, mate, he would say, from the comfort of a refectory chair after missing a tutorial. Dan is the best notes I've ever seen. Believe me, I've seen lots. (laughs) Our friendship was forged during many a late night study session at which Brad would say, Oh, I get it. Um, but could you just explain it for me one more time, mate? Just hold on I'll, I'll, while I get my pen. Hold on, not so fast. Then after simultaneously transcribing and mouthing my words, he would inevitably utter, Jeez, I reckon I'll cruise through this exam, eh? Kylie and I married a year later, after a whirlwind courtship that I can't seem to remember. Brad was, of course, the best man, my other friends having gradually deserted me during the course of the year.